Good to see everyone this morning. We will have a few missing this morning because some are away and I know that the Johnsons are self-isolating because there was an outbreak in Shannon's class on Friday. Uh, so we won't have them with us, but it's good to see you and good day to worship together. So let's begin by having a word of opening prayer. Remind myself who's doing that. That is nice, nice if you'd open some words. Morning, church. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord our God, our Father, we come here on the first day of the week to give you praise and honor, to worship you in truth and spirit, to remember the ultimate sacrifice that you paid for our salvation, and to thank you for what you did and still doing in our lives. Please be with all the members of your church that cannot make the service to you due to ill health or any other reason that you know about. Please be with all the men taking the service today. Have them administer their prayer to you in truth and spirit, speaking from their heart and soul from scripture, to remember that you are the one and true God. Please allow the preacher taking the sermon today with a lesson well prepared so that the words will benefit our lives, teaching us and guiding us into a life that you want us to live. Please have us remember the sacrifice that you made on our behalf by taking the sacraments of bread and wine that you ordained to, you, to us at your last supper, hours before your death, by bringing into force with love the new, the new covenant, allowing everyone to go through the water of baptism for the forgiveness of our sin, for you to lead us into salvation, into Christ our Lord. Please be with your church and have them leave their worries and troubles outside the door today so that we can give 100% concentration of prayer time to you. We hope that your service of worship will be pleasing to your ears today. All these things we ask in the name of your glorious Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's sing number 108. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Keep silence. Keep silence. Keep silence. Old Testament readings from 2 Kings 19, verses 29 to 34. 2 Kings 19, verses 29 to 34. This will be the sign for you. This year you will eat what grows on its own, and then the second year what grows from that. But in the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward, for a remnant will go out before Jerusalem and survivors from Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. He will enter the city, shoot an arrow here, come before it with a shield, or build up a siege ramp against it. He will go back the way he came, and he will not enter the city. This is the Lord's declaration. I will defend this city and rescue it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Amen. Amen. Morning, everyone. Uh, the New Testament reading is from Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. 
That's Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and what is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out that the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May Lord add the blessing to history. Number 18, Faithful Love. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn of the ground makes me hope, says my soul, washes whiter than so. Faithful love comes each year, reaches down, dries each tear. Father God and Almighty, we are most grateful to you, dear Lord, for the opportunity given us to live today. We know we slept with many last night, but not everybody was able to see the light. So if we are here today, and we still have breath of life in us, mm -hmm. not because we are worthy, and not because we deserve it, but we count it a blessing that God, you have bestowed on us. So we thank you so much 
that we have been counted among the living today. That is why we have gathered to worship you in truth and in spirit. We are most grateful to you, dear Lord. Father, at this hour, we are mindful of what is going on in the world, especially days, coronavirus, that has taken the world by storm. We pray together that God, you will listen to our voice and help the world to have control over these conditions. We know sometimes, God, situations like this can be a punishment to people who are disobedient to you. We read from the Old Testament how Israel was punished and many nations who were disobedient to you were punished with diseases. What is going on today in the world, we are not sure whether this is a punishment from you, God, to humanity because of the disobedient uh, heart that we have. We know the world has rejected you. We know that, God, your name doesn't sink in their ears. And if this is a punishment to us, then I will say we deserve it. But God, be merciful to us and help to take away this calamity from the world. But if it is um, what should happen, Father, still you know the best. But we pray that God, you will listen to our voices and our cry for mercy today and take away these illness from the world. We know doctors and nurses and all the scientists are trying very hard to overcome this monster that's taking the world by storm. But they cannot do anything without your help. If the Lord, you don't build a house, the builders, they work in vain. If you don't watch the city, the watchmen, they watch in vain. So though they have abandoned you, they don't know you, but God listen to the cry of your children and help the world to overcome this situation. God, we know you are our father, and whenever we pray, you listen to us. As Moses intercedes for the nation Israel, so we also is the seeding for the world that God to take control over this situation and take this illness away. Because some of us who are Christians has also, uh, have also been affected by this illness. And some of us that we know have passed away because they had this illness. So we pray that God You'll be merciful to us and remember the world, not your sins, but remember your mercy and take this illness from us. We thank you, dear Lord. And this morning, this is our humble prayer that you remember us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul, for that eloquent and much-needed prayer. Thank you. Before we come round the Lord's table this morning, let's sing, He paid a debt, in which he did. He paid a debt, he did not owe, I owe that debt, I should not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. 
And now I say upon this song, amazing prayer. Christ Jesus came in there that I could never pray. He prayed that death at Calvary. He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins and And now I can sing a brand new song, amazing grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Good morning. It's difficult handling all these bits of paper without touching anything. Do you ever get that situation where you get a tune in your head and it won't go away? It could be a pop song, it could be a Christmas song at present, you get it drummed into you as you're going around the shops. It could be a piece of classical music, or indeed it could be a hymn. Well, for the last week or so, and I'm having trouble with my mask, excuse me. For the last week or so, I've had a, a tune in my head and it wouldn't go away. It was written by one Edward Moat uh, in 1834. And it is based on 1 Corinthians 3 and 11. 1 Corinthians 3 and 11 reads, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. The song is number 538. First verse reads like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. The writer is telling us that there is no point trying to base our trust on anything less than Jesus. You're, think of your best friend your dearest friend, your sweetest friend, you cannot put your trust in them because whoever it is, they're in the same position as you are. So he says, we can build our hope on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. We can't trust anyone else. We've got to lean on Jesus' name. In verse three, he says, his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand 
before the throne. And of course, the refrain goes, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. And the essence of this song, this hymn, of course, is my hope. Hope is something that we speak about often. And I've noticed that in this congregation, hope takes a very prominent position, and rightly so. The English poet Alexander Pope lived from 1688 to 1744. He was a, a celebrated poet, particularly in England, of course. And around 1733, he wrote a poem called An Essay on Man. One phrase from that poem is very well known even today. And the phrase that we tend to hear is, hope springs eternal. The actual phrase that Alexander Pope wrote was, hope springs eternal in the human breast. And I would recommend, if you have the time, that you perhaps have a look at that poem and read the, the, fuller, the full poem. It's interesting, it's quite informative and illuminating. If you think about it, hope drives human endeavor. Students in university, colleges, are driven by the hope of achievement. A new mother is full of hope for her newborn child. The amateur athlete, I think of Cameron, who is very good at sport, or the professional athlete, they all are driven by the hope of success. Think of, well, you maybe don't want to think of our politicians, but think of political candidates. They stand for election in the hope of being appointed. People invest their time, their energy, and their money in things that they hope to achieve, things they hope for. But of course, for Christians, hope also drives our spiritual reality. Romans 8 and 28 says, we were given this hope when we were saved. That's New Living Translation. The saving hope comes from our faith, or you could say our belief, in the eternal life offered by our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John 5 and 13, the Apostle John writes, these words. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. It doesn't say that you may hope, oh, perhaps I'll have eternal life. You may know that you have eternal life. He's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to you, brother. He's speaking to you, sister. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So a question for us this morning is, do you believe in the name of Jesus? If you do, then know that you have eternal life. That is the sure and certain hope that we can have in this life. And that's actually why each one of us is here today. You're here simply, simply because of that hope. If you didn't have that hope, well, I can't speak for you, of course, but certainly if I didn't have that hope, I wouldn't waste my time being here this morning because it would be a waste of time for me if I didn't have that hope. And I would suggest that it would be a waste of time for you being here if you didn't have that hope living within you of eternal life. Because we have faith in that hope, 
faith in the grace of God and the redeeming power of Jesus' righteous blood. My faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. John goes on in chapter 5 to say these words beginning in verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world is in the power of the evil one. And I think that Paul alluded to that this morning in his prayer. Verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding to know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So on that basis, why are we here today? Because of that sure and certain hope. But also because our belief in that hope sometimes dithers. It sometimes dims and we doubt. So we come here this morning to renew our hope in Jesus, our hope based on his body and his blood. They were given in our place so that we can have life, life eternal. I believe that we need to be frequently reminded of that and of the promise that Jesus' death and his resurrection fulfill. May God bless each one of us this morning. May he give us the grace that we need in this life to hold on to the hope for our next life, that life in heaven with God and our creator. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 about the way in which he has passed on the remembrance of Jesus to all those who would follow him. And Paul records that Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, having given thanks for it. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. So this morning, would you take the bread and we'll give thanks for it before we take it. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you for this bread, which symbolizes the body of Jesus, the body sent to the cross, that we might be spared separation from you. As we take this bread this morning, Father, help us to remember the awful sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Help us to consider our position. Help us to strengthen our hope on you. Help us to focus on you in this coming week. Bless the bread to each one this morning, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.
In the same way also, Jesus took uh, the fruit of the vine and he gave thanks for it. The fruit of the vine representing his blood shed at Calvary for our sins. And it's through the shedding of that blood that we have access to our Heavenly Father. This morning, let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you so deeply from our hearts that you allowed Jesus to die for each one of us. Help us this morning, Father, as we take this fruit of the vine to see the awful, awful situation that Jesus was placed in. To marvel at, at his strength, at his commitment, his determination to go through that death for each one of us here this morning. We thank you, Father, that you raised him and that he now sits at your right hand. We thank you that through Jesus, we have access to you. Father, this morning, bless the fruit of the vine to each one of us and help us during this coming week to focus on you, to follow you, to walk in Jesus' footsteps. In his name, amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Let's now sing, He has made me glad. And with the sacrifice that Dick has just told us about, you can see why we should be glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Good morning. The sermon reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 4, and I'll be reading from verses 1 through 9. Book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. And it reads, Again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat, at, sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things and parables. And in his teachings, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some, fell, uh, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. 
and other seed fell on into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Good morning. Appreciate Brian reading that for us this morning. Appreciate the other men who've been leading us in worship this morning. I know there were some last minute adjustments because of COVID and probably some other things as well, but grateful to have them part of this and to have you here today as well. I'm trying to work this with my phone because we're trying something different. Adam usually sits there when I'm preaching or vice versa. Usually it's me because Adam's preaching and we're doing the slides and everything and then he'll say, Graham, and or, you know, whatever, we move it. Uh, we had that last week, I think, as well, with Edwin's lesson. Uh, so I'm going to try and do it this week. And then Adam can take back over and do all the rest of it. So the problem is we need the bigger pulpit again. I think we need to get that wheeled out. But it's, it's going to be a bit wobbly if we put it up here, so maybe not. Anyway, uh, we are getting close, very close, to the end of our series of growth. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And we come to Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Appreciate, as I said, Brian reading that for us. Adam will be using this as the main text in a couple of weeks, probably go slightly different direction with his lesson. Oh, Wayne, good to see you back here. Hello, how are you? Uh, and uh, I think to understand this, we need to get some context, first of all. So keep your markers in Mark, because we're pretty much exclusively in the gospel today. But we will be moving around in the gospel. We'll be covering... Chapters 1 through 16, not every single one, not every single verse you'll be grateful to know. Otherwise, uh, when I finish, Adam will just go and preach his lesson in two weeks. Uh, but we will need to establish some context here. It's useful when you're doing a study to understand what the point of the book is. And now, the Gospel of Mark is probably the first of the Gospels. That's generally recognized as the earliest Gospel that we have in the New Testament. John is typically recognized as the last of the four Gospels, not just in the sequence of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but chronologically. We attribute John to much later on in his life, probably into the 80s AD, long after all the other apostles are probably dead and having been martyred. And we think Mark is the earliest. We can't know for certain, but we know that Matthew and Luke incorporate some of Mark's Gospel into their text. They use and expand some of the, in the accounts that he records in here. And it is the shortest, the briefest one. And very quickly, you get the idea. And one of the key words that you learn in the Gospel of Mark is the word immediately. It's all over the place. Uh, you get, there's an, immediate, an immediacy of how miracles work. There's an immediacy of starting to preach verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12, chapter 1, verse 10. And if you go through the book, you'll see it over and over again. And it is generally recognized as a book that was aimed at the Roman audience, the Roman soldiers in particular, who would be great missionaries because they traveled all over the empire. And soldiers are very efficient and they like things done very easily and quickly, at least when they're on duty, maybe when they're off duty, not so much. Uh, but when they're on duty, definitely like that way and they like things to be just so. And so Mark really appeals to that aspect uh, of humanity. And it's a very important gospel. And very early on in the gospel, not only do you see this idea of immediately, you see this idea of conversation and interaction. For example, in just the first chapter, there are at least 15 ideas conveyed to us of communication. For example, in chapter 1, verse 7, John the Baptist is preaching. In verse 11, God speaks to his son. In verses 12 through 13, it's implied that Satan is speaking to Jesus. We know that from Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Jesus begins preaching the gospel. He begins calling his first disciples. He begins teaching in the synagogue. Demons are speaking to him down in verse 24. He's rebuking them in verse 25. That goes on again in verse 34. And again, they're praying that Jesus does with his father or to his father. There's preaching throughout Galilee and again, synagogues and so on and so forth. There is this constant emphasis on the interaction of communication. It's not just that there's something being said, it's being said and it's being listened to, it's being heard. Someone else is a benefactor or at least a participant in that. When you get to chapter two, see it about four times. 
when you get to chapter three, you see it about three times, and then you come to chapter four. Another thing about the Gospel of Mark is, is that it tends to congregate things. So you have some miracles in chapter one, uh, I think as well, in, in chapter two. And then by chapter four, we're talking about parables. We've got teachings there, and there's a suite of parables that are included in that particular section. But what's fascinating uh, throughout the Gospel of Mark, as well as this, is when there's an interaction that demands the opposite of communication. There is a communication, but the communication is a demand for silence. In Mark chapter 1, for example, in verse 25, the demons are addressing Jesus as the Holy One of God, and Jesus says, be quiet and come out of him. He does this again in chapter 3 in verse 12, where there's another incident this time where the demons are coming out and saying, you are the Son of God, and he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Two instances where Jesus demands, or at least rebukes, the the demons and demands of them that they say nothing about who he is. Then you have this other interesting interaction with regard to silence in chapter 1, verse 44. Jesus has healed a leper. And in verse 44, he says to the leper, say that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. You can go to Leviticus 14 and verse 13, and have a look at that and see what the rule was. If you had a skin disease and your skin disease went away, you presented yourself to the priest. The priest examined you. You made a sacrifice. You were declared clean. You could return to the main community. You had a skin disease. You had to withdraw from the community in case it was leprosy. Back then, all skin diseases were just kind of classified as leprosy because it was a very dangerous disease. And so they wanted to protect the community. But sometimes the, it cleared up. Maybe it was eczema, maybe it was psoriasis, maybe it was something else. And it cleared up and they could go back into normal society. So there's an irony in what Jesus is saying to this, this leper that he's just healed. Now that you are healed, what you have to do is go and make sure the high priest gives you the old say-so on that to return into the community. And when you're doing that, just remind yourselves that the high priest and the Sadducees deny miracles, deny angels, deny the power of the supernatural. So when you go back in and present yourself to the priest, and the priest examines you and says, yes, you're cleaned of your disease, he's just admitted the miracle. Isn't that very clever of Jesus to do that? But in verse 45, what does the man do? He goes out and tells everybody. In fact, not only does he tell everybody, Jesus can't move anymore. He walks into a town, there's Jesus, and they all swamp him. He can't go anywhere without being mobbed by the crowds around him. You go to chapter, uh, let's see, 7, verse 36. There's a number of examples. I'll give you the references, and you can look them up later. In chapter 7, verse 36, he's healed the man who's deaf and mute, does something weird uh, with his fingers and his ears and spitting and tongues and stuff like that. And uh, next thing you know, the guy can speak, and he can speak plainly. But then in verse 36, he commanded them, the people who are there in the region of Decapolis at the Sea of Galilee, he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. Seems like the bigger the secret got, the harder it got to keep the secret. And that seems to be going on. There's other instances of this kind of interaction. Matthew, Mark 5, rather, verses, uh, chapter 5, verse 43. Jesus has just healed the, the girl, uh, Talakalumthi, or you can look it up, uh, whatever it says in Aramaic. And he's got Peter, James, John, and the girl's parents, and he says, don't tell anybody. Shh. And you go on, uh, for example, to uh, chapter 8, verse 26. He commands the blind man. He's not allowed to tell anybody. You go to chapter 9, verse 9. He's been on the mountain of transfiguration. They come down off the mountain and he says to these three disciples, don't tell anybody what you're seeing, what you've seen. Chapter 11, verse 33. He he's the one that's doing the refusing this time. He refuses to answer the religious leaders when they question him. Oh, do you not answer anything? He says nothing. And then in, in that case, rather, that's uh, chapter 14, verse 61. 
um, which actually refers back to Luke 23, verse 9, where you get that uh, with Herod. But in Mark 11, 33, they ask him a question. And he says, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. And he won't answer it. I said, well, I'm not going to tell you what the answer to your question either. So you have this motif going through the Gospel of Mark of an interaction of people when something is being said, and other times when something's been said or done, and you're not allowed to talk about it. Shh. Let's keep silence on it. But when Jesus speaks in Mark chapter 4 in particular, but in other passages as well, but in chapter 4, notice in verse 3 that Jesus says, listen. And then down in verse 9, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And each of these three words, listen, to hear, infinitive, and let him hear, each one of these is the exact, exact same root of the word, same lemma, which is the kind of the dictionary form. If you're going to look up this word in the Greek, it's the same word for each one. And the only thing that changes is the person and number, which means Emma's the only one in the group here that understands what I just said, because she teaches languages. But basically, you talk about first person, second person, third person, singular and plural. First of all, he says in verse three, listen to everybody. It's uh, second person plural. As they might say in the South, as they might say in Alabama, all y'all listen to me. That's what he's saying there. It's the plural you. You don't really do a plural you, Mike. You just do you. And we have to figure out whether it's one person or two people that we're talking to, or more than two people. But he's saying, listen to each one of them. First of all, he says in, in verse three, all y'all, we'll go with the American one or not, or let's, let's go Glasgow, use, listen. Right? Oh, there you go, that's fair. I got a chuckle for that one. If Andrew were here, he might have laughed at the early one, but we've got that one. Use, listen, right? But then in verse 9, what he says is, he who is listening, listen, or she who is listening, listening both apply because uh, the verb could go either masculine or feminine. So basically, that everybody needs to hear this, but individually, you can only respond individually. This is a parable that is about hearing. It's a parable about listening, and therefore it's a parable about doing it because of the response that is commanded of the individual. All may hear the gospel, but how will the individual respond to the gospel? So why, why even listen to Jesus at all? Well, Mark's already established that in the earlier chapters, and he continues to build on that as the chapters that follow will emphasize. Because Jesus is out there curing everything. He's going into every town that he goes to, and it doesn't matter what's wrong with you, Jesus can fix it. If you're dead in the ground, Jesus can bring you back up again. We see that in John chapter 11. He can make the blind to see. He can make the lame to walk. He can make the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, and so on and so forth. Jesus is this part. He can cast out demons. That's constant through even the first three chapters. But when he rebukes the demons for speaking, what's fascinating is they obey him. When Jesus says in chapter 1 and in chapter 3, verse 12, for example, stop speaking, which is effectively what he's telling them, he's commanding them, stop saying that I'm the Holy One of God, stop saying I'm the Son of God. They obey him immediately. But when he talks to a leper who's just had the greatest gift of his life, don't tell anybody. What does he go and do? He goes and tells everybody. Everybody gets to hear about this. Everybody has to know about this message. I can't not tell. He's told me not to tell, but I have to go and tell everybody. And that's the contrast that Mark's building upon. Whereas the demons are commanded to be silent and to obey him, the leper is commanded to be silent. They can't because the experience of Christ in his life, he can barely contain and the same be said of us. We see Jesus' power all over the spiritual world. He can control us only when we fully submit to his will. Demons don't have a choice. When God says stop it, they have to stop it. When God says submit, they have to submit. When God says enough, they have to, they have to accept that that's the end of it. We see this even in the temptation of Christ. When Jesus starts rebuking satan what does satan do he goes away james builds on this resist the devil and he will flee from you 
kind of power does the, the Satan really have? What kind of power does darkness really have? Turn on the lights and have a look. If you think about that, you might actually see what I'm saying about it. It has no power, certainly not when it comes to God, but what about us? We have free will, but it is not arrested simply by the command. There's more that we have to do. His will is only exercised over us when we fully submit to it. And this is especially useful to understand, very important for us to understand when compared to the command that is given to the demons in their response. Mark's, call, uh, Mark's <clears throat> excuse me, gospel makes use of the command to remain silent and the subsequent responses to it. He's building what you may call a wee motif of his, a, a, another little motif that he builds into it. Demons must obey, but humans, well, they're either going to obey him or they're not. For example, in Mark chapter 5, verse 19, uh, we have there the incident where a, de um, a demon-possessed man is healed. And in verse 19, Jesus says, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done. And here's the opposite of the leper. The leper, don't tell anybody. Go and do the right thing and all the rest of it. If he didn't do that, he'd have been sinning. If he didn't go to the high priest and present himself, he'd have been breaking the law. So Jesus is perhaps encouraging him uh, to be silent simply until he achieves that purpose. But I think there's a bit more to it than that. Here in Mark 5, 19, though, he's just released a man from a demon. And he tells the guy, go and tell everybody. And really, when Jesus comes back to that region, there's a fantastic response to the work that he does in that region because of that man who was cleansed. You go to Mark chapter 16, verse 7, the resurrection of Christ. And uh, the, the woman is told, I think it's Mary Magdalene, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Make sure Peter knows of all of them. Tell them all, but make sure Peter knows. And off they go and tell him. So you got this kind of, what's going on here? Sometimes he says, don't tell. Sometimes he's demanding that they do tell and insisting upon it. One possible explanation is, well, the demons knew who Jesus really was. He's the son of God. He's a holy one of God. He is the, he is God who became flesh and dwelt amongst us, as John would discuss. They knew him before his incarnation in flesh. But their testimony at that time could not be tolerated. <coughs> One could make the argument that we are to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the demon's life, its existence is not in harmony with truth. It's out of harmony, it's out of sync with truth. So you can't have the demon. But here's the interesting thought, and I've actually preached that kind of lesson in the past. But here's the interesting thought. Mark does record it. Now, Mark writes it after the resurrection. After we get to see Jesus as the Son of God, Acts 2, verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. So now we get to declare Jesus the way the demons did, that is to say he's the Holy One of God, he's the Son of God, he is Lord and Christ post-resurrection because we see him in his majesty and in his glory and in the power that he has. They didn't have that right to do that although they still use testimony after the fact. And therein lies the rub for us. The demons knew Jesus to be the son, but we can only know it as a consequence of his resurrection. He could make the claim to be the son of God or the son of man, which is his preferred title of the two. You see son of God a lot more in the gospel of Matthew than anywhere else. But it's not really until resurrection that it's understood. That's why he tells Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, Shh, don't tell anybody. This isn't for telling everybody yet. But we do know about it. How do we know about it? After the resurrection. We get to hear the story of the transfiguration. Now it's okay to see it. So why forbid any human from giving their testimony that Jesus is the Son of God during Christ's life? Well, it's not entirely true. It's not a, a fair question. Because there are some who are told to go out and, and tell their message and, and give their message. And, of course, Jesus does speak to himself of that. But it is a plot device that is especially noted in Mark 7, 36. The more he commands them to keep silent, the more they told it. The more they ignored him, it seems. So the reason goes much further than just simply a basic thing. And it goes back to our passage in Mark chapter 4. And it relates to the consequences that we see in Mark chapter 16. I'm not sure I understand.
That's okay, I'll tell you later. I, we, we see the resurrection of Christ. We see an empty tomb. We see garments just abandoned in the tomb and a napkin that was on the face folded carefully and set aside. We see angels sitting on the stone. We see a gardener confronting or having a conversation with Mary. We see a call for the disciples to come and see for themselves. We see appearances. And ultimately, we see the power of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 coming. It is upon the revelation of the resurrection of Jesus in the years that followed that the church could barely contain itself from telling others about Jesus. An encounter with the now resurrected Jesus was not necessarily the personal kind that the disciples experienced in Mark 16 or the other Gospels. Nor is it like Saul's road to Damascus experience in Acts chapter 9. But for each one of us, it's still a personal experience. Because each one of us who wears the name Christian does so because our sins are forgiven. Because we died to sin, Romans 6, 3 and 4. We were buried with him in water and we were raised again to walk in the newness of life. That's our experience of Christ through the forgiveness of sin. So then, do we tell or do we keep silent? The former is the only acceptable response. We have to tell. We cannot keep silent because we're not commanded to keep silent. We can't go to Mark chapter 1, verse 44 and say, this is what Jesus wants me to do. He wants me to keep silent about it. No. Uh, we have to go to Mark 16, 15 and 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. This then is the context of Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. The parable that we've read, that, that Brian read for us this morning. Some call it the parable of the seed. Some call it the parable of the sower. Some call it the parable of the soils. We view it as a lesson with a focus on the types of soils. Kind of heart of you. In fact, when we drafted this lesson over a year ago, it was with a view of the receptive heart, of how to prepare the heart, make your heart ready to receive the word and have it sown in. And there's lots of passages that talk about that as well. But actually, this is a parable about the farmer's actions in sowing the seed. The recipient of the seed, the recipients of the seed rather, are secondary to the behavior of the one who has the seed in the first place. He's the focus of the lesson. So we need a little bit of history on this. Because in this story, in this parable, you've got this, what seems to us perfectly normal, I suppose, because we're all farmers, right? I mean, no, that's right, none of us are farmers. But it, it seems to make sense. I mean, surely this is how we do it. We've all been behind a gritter in the winter. We know how that stuff scattered. That's how we just throw it out there, chip my paint, you know, just do that, you know, get rust my car, why don't you? And we're, we're grateful for the gritter, but we don't want to get too close. That's what we think of when we think of scattering. But actually, Jesus has a habit when he tells his parables of conflicting with what they actually know. Because in the first century, this is more kind of like how they did the farming thing. You know, when you buy your seeds and you plant your seeds, you're not just going to scatter them everywhere because seed costs money. Farmers in the first century Palestine area are poor and every seed needs to count. You can't just put your seed out there and hope that, oh, yeah, I'll just throw it out there. I've got loads of seed, you know. I just imagine Ronnie out there with 20-pound notes in that list. We got loads of these, just throw them about. I'll just hand them out to everybody, whoever wants them. That's not what we do. Then he sits down with Ronnie and he says, no, nope, you're going to give a 20 pound note and you're going to put it in this wee envelope. We're going to seal it up and that goes to, that goes to Adam. And then the 50 pound note, that goes to Graham. And then a 100 pound note, I'll keep that. That goes in my pocket. You know, that's what we do, isn't it? We don't just go out there with Christmas cards and just throw them up there and say, like, Merry Christmas. We don't do that. Neither the, neither the farmers in the first century. So the first thing Jesus has done is, here's a farmer scattering seed, and the crowd's thinking, who does that? Nobody's got that kind of money to throw about. Because let's say it's seed, it's, you know, it costs money. Not only that, 
if it doesn't work, that is to say, if it doesn't catch, if it doesn't plant properly and grow and harvest properly, then where are you going to eat this winter? Where's your cereals going to come from in January and February? They're going to struggle with that. Seed is precious, each one counts, stainlessly cast it onto the hard surfaces, knowing only too well that the birds are going to swoop in and have it before the echo of its fall ends as profligate. Never go out into the countryside. Apparently, it's just outside the boundaries of these towns that we live in. But if you go out into the countryside when the farmers are out there and they're sowing whatever it is they're sowing in the ground, there's always a flock of birds coming in after them, isn't there? So they have these devices that not only put the seed in, but then fold the soil over it so the birds can't get it. So they're looking for the bits that didn't, that got away. But the first century farmer knows what the birds are like. To cast it poorly around so that it springs up, but it doesn't really have the depth that it has, well, that's just wasteful. Okay, the seed grew, but it then withered and died. Or for that matter, to allow it to sprout and then not go back and look after the ground, to monitor it for the weeds and uh, for weeds and to nurture it, to allow it to be choked out by thorns and thistles, that's just lazy. And there's one thing we should learn about farmers is lazy farmers don't last as farmers. Pretty hardworking guys if they want to be successful. And yet, the picture that we have is of a guy just throwing that seed about. And it, you can just imagine the crowd thinking, who does that? But that's what Jesus is teaching. Because our job as Christians is to spread the seed with no thought as to where it lands. It's not our precious commodity that we've bought with our money, with our sweat and toil of the ground, that we then carefully and sparingly sow and nurture wherever we can expect the best results. That's not what the parable is teaching. Doing that misses the point of the parable. We face multitudinous opportunities to share the gospel. But don't we make judgments about whom we may expect to respond or not? If we are honest with ourselves, we may be judging someone of not being worthy of the gospel. And that goes against the grain of this parable. No pun intended. Actually, when I read that last night, there wasn't a pun intended, but I'll put in pun intended. But uh, I kind of came across that way. Right? How do we compare with a leper? He was told to be silent, cured of a thing that separated him from the community. Have we not been cured of something that separates us from the community of God? We call it sin. Hasn't Jesus forgiven us of our sin? Who are we going to tell about that? He was told to be silent, but he told everyone to the point that Jesus was instantly recognizable and mobbed. How do we compare to those who were with the, the deaf man in Mark chapter 6 and verse 36? The more he commands them to keep quiet, the more they tell others what they had witnessed. The contrast is with the demons. They were in a time and place where their sins could not be forgiven. They had nothing to offer that could glorify God. They were not only commanded to keep silent, but they were powerless to resist that command. Are we as easily silenced as the demons? Because I'll tell you this, and this is coming over my shoulder. This went through me last night, hit me like a hammer. The moment I am not telling people about Christ and the power of his resurrection in my life and the forgiveness of sins and the blessing that is to anyone else's life in whom, within, within, with whom I come in contact is me behaving like the demons. Surely the same's not true of us. We are commanded to tell. We are to scatter that seed that is the word of God. We are to care for it and nurture it, to look after those who hear and respond to the gospel as part of our Christian's life. But it's not what's being taught in Mark chapter 4. We get that from other passages. You can get that idea of nurturing and caring from Romans and well, Paul's letters and the book of Hebrews and Peter's letters, for example, to name a few. But basically the rest of the Bible talks about it. But what Mark 4 is emphasizing to us is that here is the guidance on what you do with the gospel. Scatter it. Because it's a reminder to us to listen to what Jesus is saying. Which means that we have to be so, so Christians. And this is the only time, if you look at the screen, Paul, you'll see what I'm trying to say. 
Uh, we, that's the only time we're ever allowed to be so so Christians when we're sowing the word of God. That's what's required of us. That's why we are here. We are to provide the greatest story ever told to anyone and everyone. It's a great time of year to do that because some people's minds at least might be thinking in terms of nativity and the birth of Jesus and all the rest of it. Maybe in a manger, not very threatening, not very intimidating, not particularly challenging. But if people are thinking about it, let's talk about what it really means. The Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. The opportunity to engage and take it forward a step to where Jesus ended up, which was at the right hand of the throne of God. We have to proclaim it. We have a super abundance of this seed that is the gospel. So we don't have to be frugal with it. We don't have to carefully measure out where each word of God goes. There are warnings about that. You know, don't cast your pearls before swine, for example. But we can understand the poor farmer stretching out his stock of seed that determines whether or not he survives the next winter. But us, as Christians, seriously, are we skimping when it comes to the message of the gospel? I guarantee you, uh, Adam just drools when he wakes up on Christmas Day because he's thinking, if we're going to Maureen's for Christmas dinner, I remember that when it was Jack and Maureen's, you know, there's going to be the turkey and there's going to be all the trimmings and there's going to be, a, I remember thank, Thanksgiving in America. Oh my goodness. Who ever thought to put marshmallows in, on, on yams? Oh, what a great invention. Or bacon and green beans. Hallelujah. I mean, that's just, it saves green beans. It makes them delicious again. Mary and Ronnie are laughing, they're chuckling because they remember that in Arkansas, am I right? There was so much food that Ronnie was as wide as he was tall throughout the Thanksgiving week. We've got the gospel. We don't have to measure it out. We had one chicken. I remember when for Christmas we had one chicken. I, I used to, I was five years old, looking at this chicken and thinking, how is that supposed to feed all the living of us? But it did. My mom made sure it did. Nobody was able to go for the chicken. You got your chicken on a plate and that was it. Why do we skimp with the message of the gospel? We wouldn't feel very good about that on Christmas Day. Okay, you're going to have one chip of lacquer wrapped in a little bit of bacon with your one bit of turkey. Forget about the drumstick, you're not getting that. That The parable of the sower is telling us that we don't need to behave like that with the gospel. Our job in this context is to be so, so Christians. And that's the most important point that Jesus is emphasizing in this parable. Because we discover one of the greatest truths that it contains. It is God who makes the seed achieve greatness. Not me. That's not my job. My job is not to make sure that the word of God brings about greatness. That's God's job. My job is just to get it out there. My job is to try and get other people to listen to it. God does the rest. You know, you just had a wee video up there for a moment. A time lapse of a couple of pumpkin seeds growing. And out they pop. And I love those kind of time lapse things where a thing just bursts out, you know, and you, or you see a flower blossoming. Uh, which we kind of had in Adam's video uh, this morning as well. I love those kind of things, those kind of those kind of pictures. But that's what the word of God does. When it lands on good soil, it makes its most important impact because of God, not because I'm a good judge of character, not because I've got a great eye for who might and might not be a Christian. I can't do that. When we sow like an impoverished farmer, we deny God the opportunity to do what he does best. I am still blown away by the story of Joseph in Egypt. When he goes and interprets the dream of Pharaoh, and there's going to be seven years of plenty, and then there's going to be seven years of famine. So what we need to do is, during the seven years of plenty, we're going to put a 20% tax on all the product. And we're going to drag in 20% of all the crops for the next seven years. And we're going to put it in big storehouses. They found that the archaeologists have dug those things up. And the only explanation they can find is in the book of Genesis, which I find quite fascinating. And so that's what they did. And then when the famine came, during the seven years, the 20%, if you think about it, every year 
they had a fifth, which meant for every year of famine, they had a fifth of what they originally had. The fifth that they had been given by God was not only enough to feed everybody, it was enough to feed the rest of the world as well. Because when God gets to do what God does best, there's more than we can possibly handle. And so we just need to get the word out there. We just need to sow it out there and try and get people to listen to it. God takes something that's seemingly dead. That's what a seed is. It's basically a dead thing. And yet somehow when it goes into the soil and it gets watered and it gets the right temperature or whatever, it just suddenly springs into life. Melia and I, she'll tell you the same thing, you know, diving under the cover, under the sink, have a look and see how the crocus was doing. And we got one from class. I remember doing that as well. Who are we to judge God's word as incapable of making a difference to a hearer's life? As Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted a polis watered, but it was God who gave the increase. Whether the leper sinned or not when he told others, that's for God to decide. It may cause us to scratch our heads. It may make us wonder and ponder about why he did the opposite of what Jesus commanded. But he's not there as a chin scratcher. He's there, nor is he necessarily sinning by telling the good things about the Messiah. Instead, what he is, is that there's a reminder of the experience of an encounter with Jesus that should be such in our lives that it's just difficult to contain. Even to the point where Jesus says, be quiet. And he's like, I can't. I've got to tell people. What of ours? We who have been forgiven of sin. Remember this about the, I'll tell you this. Um, I know folk in the congregation who have long-term health problems, they're here every Sunday, they take medication for it. Tell you what, the doctor gave them a pill and it took it away like that. Do you think they would tell others that had that same problem? Absolutely they would. What about forgiveness of sins? Because remember this, the parable of the sower still applies once we become Christians. Not just in terms of the thrust of what I'm saying, but also in terms of how we continue to receive the word of God. Its message is not only about the preaching of the gospel to the lost, it's about the continuing message of the gospel to the saved. It's about saying, well, I am a Christian, but I need to keep growing. I need to keep producing. I need to keep learning. I need to keep being what I am meant to be as a so-so Christian. We are in Christ. We are hearing his message now. How do we respond to it? What are our hearts doing with the message even now? Do we barely contain our response to this outpouring of his love? Do we shout from the hills every time we hear the name of Jesus preached and the glory of God magnified? You know, I'll sit there and sometimes I'm sitting over there and I'll kind of glance over at the Daniel family and I'll think, those boys, I tell you what, they make some noise. But then I look at Kim and She's so deep into her worship and her praise of God when she's singing. So oblivious to the world around. Not, not, not the boys, I don't mean that, but just so deep into it. Is that what we're like in a relationship with Christ? I remember years ago, I was in America. I went to Cree Hall, Adam, and I was sitting there. At Gary Hall had taken me along to worship there. And I was sitting there and they were singing the songs and I just glanced over to Gary and his eyes were closed and he was singing and he was praising God. And I thought, what a beautiful picture to see. Or do we choose silence? Do we look for the excuse? The command to be silent, to exempt us from our duty as Christians to sow the word of God and pray for a harvest. 2021 has been the year when we said, grow. Today's the penultimate lesson. As I said, in two weeks, Adam's going to conclude our series. But don't think that the arrival of 2022 is the end of the call to grow. It isn't. In fact, really, 2021 has been the call to listen. Because that's where growing starts. It's where it begins. God wants us to grow in this area of our lives, to become sores of the seed that is the word of God. Not only are we to hear this parable, but in hearing it, 
we are to think about it and allow its message to germinate in our hearts. We're to listen to Jesus. We're to obey his voice. And the instruction he has given to us is go and preach the gospel. We're to give others the opportunity to become a part of this amazing family that is Christ's church. To make known to others the power and the willingness of God to save humanity from sin. And so we need to grow in this ministry. And we do it by being so, so Christians. God bless you. Thank you, Graham. Let's sing It Is Well With My Soul. Let's stand for this one if you can. When peace like a river attended my way, when so
we can uh, turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'll be reading verses 6 and 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, you always having all sufficiency and all things may have an abundance for every good work. At this time, as we prepare our minds for giving, I just want to ask the question, how do we give? Is it something that we think about? Or has it got to the point that when that slide comes up on the screen, we start to shuffle in our pockets and see if there's any change left over to to throw into the envelopes. And if there's nothing in our pockets, do we not give it all? There's a specific mindset that, that God wants us to have towards giving. Uh, we, we are commanded to do so. And we've just read that if our giving is empty, you, you gain nothing. And don't get the idea that I, I have to give, you know, we do this every Sunday, that's just what we do. Um, it's more than that. We have to give with, with joy in our hearts. And there's no benefit to giving if you're not happy to do so. And we shouldn't think about the amount that the next person is given and, and be discouraged and, and think that, you know, I'm not able to match that amount. You know, God doesn't assess the amount of money that goes into our envelopes and he assesses our hearts. We all know the story of the poor widow and, and Jesus says to his disciples, uh, he tells them, this woman has given more than, than anyone here. Why? It's, it's not because of the amount that she's put, uh, she put in. Um, it was because her heart was in the right place. So as we prepare to give, um, let's, let's assess ourselves and make sure that our hearts are in the right place and let's give with joy and God will bless us for that. Let's pray. Go on now, Father, we thank you for this day you've given us where we can come together to worship you. At this time, we pray that you'll open our hearts and minds to understand the way you'd have us give, Father, not grudgingly, but with joy in our hearts, Father, and pray that whatever is given, we're able to use it to your glory, Father. We love you and praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 992, can I ask you to stand again while we sing this and remain standing for our closing prayer? Can you count the stars of evening that are shining in the sky? Can you count the clouds that daily over all the God the Lord who doth not slumber, keepeth all the boundless number, but he careth more for thee, but he careth more for thee. Can you count the birds that warble in the sunshine all the day? Count the little fishes that have sparkling waters play. God the Lord, their number knoweth, for each one is very sure. Shall we not remember thee? Shall we not remember thee? Count the many children in the little beds at night, who without a thought of sorrow rise again at morning light. God the Lord who dwells in heaven, loving care to each 
Father, we pray that this worship service this morning has been acceptable to you. As we go our separate ways, Father, we ask that you remain with us. Give us the strength and courage, Father, to spread your word everywhere. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 